Hi there. Let's talk about Plotinus and set theory. I'm Eric Steinhardt, and you can learn more about me at www.ericsteinhardt.com. I'm a professor of philosophy at William Patterson University. Let's talk about Platonism and mathematics. Plotinus was a Platonist, and the Platonists loved mathematics. But before we talk about Plotinus, let's talk about another Platonist, Proclus, who lived from about 412 to 485 AD. He was a great Platonic philosopher. He wrote a book, The Elements of Theology, based on Euclid's The Elements of Geometry. It has the structure of theorems and proofs. It contains a fascinating discussion of parts and holes, section 8 of holes and parts. It's got several propositions and proofs then of those propositions, which we won't go into here. For here, what's interesting to us, for us, what's interesting about Proclus is that after set theory was developed in the 20th century, parallels were noticed between Proclus's theory of holes and Georg Cantor's theory of sets. And there you see an article by Robert Brumbaugh comparing sets and holes. Now, even though Plotinus lived almost 200 years before Proclus, there are many mathematical themes in Plotinus's work. And so some of the set theoretic ideas you see later in Proclus emerge from Plotinus. Plotinus wrote a treatise on numbers. There it is, Sixth Aeneid, uh, Sixth Tractate on Numbers. And there are many set theoretic ideas in the Aeneids of Plotinus, and those are what we're going to explore here. Let's start with the argument for a simple thing. Plotinus gives this argument. Here's what he says. Standing before all things, there must exist something simple, existing by itself and not mixed with the other things that come from it, and yet able in some way of its own to be present to those other things. It must be really one, not merely something made one by gluing things together, which would thus not really be one. Since it has no share in multiplicity, it is wholly self-sufficient, the first which comes before all others. For anything which is not the first requires something before it, and anything which is not simple needs its simple components so that its composite existence can come into being from them. There can be only one first, for if there were another, the two would not differ in any way and would resolve into one. That's from the 5th Aeneid, Tractate 4, Section 1, and the translation is Armstrong. Let's break this down. Let's start with the idea of foundation. Plotinus says in red, we'll focus on that, for anything which is not the first requires something before it, and anything which is not simple needs its simple components so that its composite existence can come into being from them. What's he saying here? Something that's not the first requires something before it. Any later thing depends on some earlier things, or something which is not simple needs its simple components. Any complex thing depends on some simpler things. The idea here is that any whole depends on its parts, or any set depends on its members. We're focusing now on the dependency relation. Any later thing depends on some earlier things. For instance, children depend on their parents, parents depend on grandparents, grandparents depend on great-grandparents, and so it goes. Any complex thing depends on some simpler things. Bodies depend on cells. Cells depend on molecules. Molecules depend on atoms. And so it goes. Think of some complex thing. You can see it's complex. It's got all those little nested circles indicating its complexity. It depends on some simpler thing. That depends on some even simpler thing, which depends on some simpler thing, and ultimately on some completely simple thing that's going to start the whole chain. Right? The whole chain will unfold in the opposite direction from the simple to the complex. Now, Plotinus said any simple, anything which isn't the first needs something before it. Anything which is not simple needs its simple components. This leads to an axiom of foundation. There are no infinite regressions of dependencies. Since a loop makes for an infinity, there aren't going to be any loops of dependencies either. That means every series of dependencies bottoms out after finitely many steps in some independent thing or things. Right? So we go back to the first along some chain of dependencies. Let's get to the next principle in Plotinus's paragraph, and that's in the red. There can be only one first, for if there were another, the two would not differ in any way and would resolve into one. Suppose we had some complex thing there on the right, and we have two dependency chains going back from it, and they look exactly the same. Plotinus says, no way, can't have that. Why not? Well, there can be only one first, 
If they didn't differ, they'd be the same. If two apparently distinct things do not differ in any way, then they are really the same thing. For instance, Clark Kent and Superman, even though they have two names, they wear two different sort of suits of clothes, they're really the same guy. More formally, this principle says that for any X and for any Y, if X and Y don't differ in any way, then X is identical with Y. Uh, to say that X and Y do not differ in any way means that they agree in every way. Their ways are their properties. So if they agree on all their properties, they're going to be the same. We formalize this as the axiom of identity, sometimes called the axiom of extensionality. For anything X and for anything Y, if X and Y share all their properties in common, then X is identical with Y. Let's look back at the case uh, of regression from Plotinus. If we have a complex thing regressing along two descending dependency chains to two simple things, A and B, now we're going to break it down. There's A and B. A is simple, original, independent, and creative. B is simple, original, independent, and creative. They agree on all their properties. Those really are the only properties they have. And so they're equal. They're really the same thing. So, we've got those two axioms, and now let's go over Plotinus's argument for a simple thing. We start with the obvious. There are some complex things. The foundation axiom says for anything which isn't the first, there's something before it. If it's not simple, it has some simple components. Therefore, there exists at least one simple thing. In other words, at least one first. Now, the identity of indiscernibles, that axiom of identity, says there can be only one first. Right? If there were two, they would resolve into one. And from 3 and 4, we conclude 5. Therefore, there exists exactly one simple first thing. Standing before all things, there must exist something simple, and so on. What is the simple thing? Plotinus gives us some clues that are highlighted there in the red. It's not merely something made by one by gluing things together. And anything which is not simple needs its simple components, so its composite existence can come into being from them. Plotinus is talking about wholes and parts, or sets and members. He's talking about gluing things together. He's talking about the components of composite things. So he's talking about simple versus complex beings. He's not really talking here about the one, even though uh, some people think that he is talking about the one. The one exists differently. It's not, it's not going to be contrasted with things glued together or sim things that need components and have composite existence. So the simple original being is a whole with no parts or a set with no members. I'm going to go with the set theoretic interpretation here and say that the simple original being is the empty set. This gives us the axiom of the empty set. There exists a set with no members. It has no members. Equivalently, it has no parts. It's just simple. Now, let's go away from the empty set with an idea that every many has its one. Plotinus often says that every many has its one. There are several sources. He says many soldiers come together to make an army. Many bricks or stones come together to make one house. He says, deprived of unity, a thing ceases to be what it is called. No army unless as a unity. A chorus, a flock, must be one thing. Even house and ship demand unity. One house, one ship. Unity gone, neither remains. That's from the 6th Aeneid, 9.1. Let's look at his case of the army. There's the army. The army is the set that contains those four soldiers as its members. Right? So the army is a distinct thing. Right? Every many, those four soldiers have their one, which is the army. The army is the set containing the four soldiers. But where do the many come from? Since unity comes before multiplicity for Plotinus, the many must come from some already existing unity. They must come from some already existing set. For instance, the many come from some already unified army. And now the principle that every many has its one looks like this. Every plurality of soldiers in the army makes a sub-army. So we have a sub-army of three soldiers, we have a sub-army of two soldiers. But now we say the principle that every many has its one means that given any set, every plurality of members from that set makes a subset. But must the many really be a multiplicity? After some battle, maybe only one soldier survives, so the army now contains one soldier. But the army is still distinct from the soldier. Every soldier is in a sub-army of one. Thus, every one soldier has its own right? Sub-army of one. Every one has its one. There's the sub-army of one soldier. The sub-army is distinct from the soldier, just as a set is distinct from its member. 
Do we have any support from this idea from Plotinus? We do. He says Plotinus says that individual things have their own forms. There is a form of Socrates, and the form of Socrates contains exactly one instance, namely Socrates himself. Now, the extension of any form is its set of instances. So the extension of the form of Socrates is a set with one member. It's the set that just contains Socrates. There it is, with Socrates written in braces. Just as the form is not identical with its one instance, so the set is not identical with its one member. Sets can have one member. But what about a set that has no member? Does every nun have its one? Must the sub-army contain any members at all? What if all the soldiers are killed in battle? Now the army has no soldiers. It's an army of none. The empty set is a sub-army of none. There it is, a sub-army with no soldiers. That's the empty set. So we generalize the idea that every many has its one into saying this. Given any set, every way of selecting members from that set makes a subset. Every way of selecting them, whether we select many, one, or none. Now we have another question. Do all the subsets of some original set make up some new unity, or do they just exist as separate things? Since the action of the one is universal, it binds all the subsets of an original set into a new unity, the power set of the original set. This gives us the power set axiom. Given any original set, its power set is the set of all binary strings of length n, where n is the number of members in that original set. The binary strings represent the ways of selecting and rejecting the members of the set. Uh, the digit 0 indicates rejection. The digit 1 indicates selection. I've explained this uh, at great length in another video on sets and power sets, and I won't go into this here. So Plotinian set theory, right, from the text of Plotinus, we can extract four set theoretic axioms, the axiom of identity or extensionality. For any x and y, if they agree on all properties, then they're identical. The foundation axiom, there are no endless regressions. The empty set, there exists an empty set. And the power set axiom, for any original set, there exists a power set of that original set. Let's put the axioms to work, starting with the empty set, to generate a sequence of power sets. We start with the empty set. There it is in the red circle. We form its power set, the set of all strings of length 0. There's just one of those, the empty string. So the power set of the empty set is the set containing the empty string. We start with that set, contains one member. We have a rejection and a selection. We get the power set, contains two members, 0 and 1. The power set of the empty string is a set with 0 and 1. We repeat this action. The set containing 0, 1 has a power set containing all binary strings of length 2. There are four of them. So the power set of 0, 1 is 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, that set. And we continue this. The power set of the set with four members has 16 members. There it is. Um, and we go on. Generally speaking, the power sets form a series of levels. The nth level in the series is called v sub Vn. The zeroth level V0 is the empty set. The next level Vn plus 1 is the power set of the previous level Vn. And this builds a tree which I showed in another video, right? The rich or thick tree of binary strings, starting from the empty string and going up through uh, one, two, three levels. And so this tree continues. It continues and continues forever, endlessly, infinitely. Plotinus talks about these kinds of trees. He defines the one as a simple root. He says, for think of the life of a huge tree, which goes through the whole of it while its origin remains and is not dispersed over the whole, since it is, as it were, firmly settled in the root. So this origin gives to the tree its whole life in its multiplicity, but remains itself not multiple, but the origin of the multiple life. That's in the third Ennead 8.10. You can see similar passages in 3.3.7 and 6.8.15. This is the image of the tree, the great tree rising up from the root, which is the one, branching out into multiplicity. Thank you very much. This has been Eric Steinhardt talking to you about Plotinus and set theory. You can learn more about me at www.ericsteinhardt.com.